everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. I'm very excited to be here with Lee Wiley Midski and Marenike Giwa Onaiwu from the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. We're really excited to be working together to bring a webinar series called Liber Liberating Webinars. Um, and I am very excited about being here with both of you again today. Um, so today we wanted to discuss uh, an amazing presentation that Lee's son gave, um, and it's respecting autistic ways of playing, interacting, and making friends. Um, so we're going to kind of go through some of the topics first, and then we're going to show you um, his video, which is just awesome. So mm -hmm. thanks for being here. Um, so the first topic, Lee, that uh, your son talks about is that um, you are not his voice. Um, so do you want to go into that more with us and, and help us understand why that's such an important concept? Um, yes. So um, a lot of times I would um, see parents say that they are their child's voice and I never wanted to be that. I wanted to amplify his voice and support him, but I never wanted to speak for him. So, um, you know, since he was little, I've always like tried to instill, um, I guess like a sense of like a, some self advocacy skills in him. And he's always been like, he's never been afraid to say no to us and <laughs> to me or his dad. <laughs> and I think that's really important. And he's always been able to speak his mind and you know say what he wants to say, whether we agree with it or not. And we work together to like solve problems, which I think is um, very important for all. Like we're a, a neurodivergent household. Like every one of us is neurodivergent, and we all have different access needs. So we try to work together and um, come up with solutions to things. So he's always, I've always like you know, tried to get him to um, speak for himself and do that in the way that works best for him. And he's definitely happier for that. And I, I've had people tell me that I'm his voice and I say, no, I'm not his voice. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So that's like a big deal for both of us. But um, I really don't want people to think I'm speaking for him ever. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And in in our case, you know, being the parent of an AAC user uh, who doesn't use speech, um, you know, a lot of people assume that she might not have her own voice, but that's not really the case. And um, so same as you, I always try to just like empower her to advocate for herself non-verbally and, you know, through other means. And um, I think it's really important that, especially as neurotypical parents who maybe can't quite have the same experience as their child that we always try to give them that voice and not speak over them and you know be more of like the microphone rather than the actual uh, voice. I love that analogy of the microphone. Um, I think about a lot so I know when parents say that they are well intended. They're saying I love my kid I'm in this with my kid, we're to, you know, I, I'm going to make sure that the world treats my child right. And I want you to see how beautiful and wonderful they are. Yeah. But, you can, but doing that as a microphone, as opposed to being the speaker is so much better. And, you know, no matter how much, yes, a parent, you're raising your child, you love your child, you know your child, but you are not your child. And I right. just think about the analogies they use in the adoption community, you know, and myself as a person who has you know, children who are adopted and biological, I love my children. I love, love, love them. I've been there. Um, those are my babies. They don't have to have my DNA, but I don't have their experience. And, and so when it's important for me to use my privilege as someone who isn't adopted to share the perspectives of people who are, um, I can throw my two cents in when it's needed. But, you know, again, the other 98 cents needs to come from the people who know what they're talking about. And as soon as they uh, have been able, and usually it doesn't matter if a person's speaking or young, usually they can make their, themselves known and what they want heard. That's the parent should fade back. If your voice is loud enough, you don't need a microphone. You can just project alone. Right. And I should go back and say that, um, Lee, you have created this amazing resource for people. Um, which we will definitely link to so that 
everyone can see how awesome it is. Um, do you want to tell us a little more about the Neurodiversity Library and why you created it and um, what your goals for it are? Well, um, so actually my son and I both created the library together because a few years ago we were at our local library looking at um, books about autism and there were only three books in our library and we are a small town so it's pretty rural here and um, the only books, two of them were by parents who were not autistic and the other one was by an autistic person, but the, it was geared, like it was, the audience was for parents. And I, I just, I, everything, if I'm autistic myself, but even before I was, I recognized that or like, <clears throat> kind of like, I don't want to say diagnosing, I was diagnosed, but I, before I was like comfortable claiming that identity, I guess, mm -hmm. um, I learned from other autistic people how to support my son. And um, I wanted other parents to have that resource, but I also wanted autistic people to have a resource where they could, you know, learn about autistic culture and not be ashamed of who they were. Yeah. And know that like there's a huge community out there and there's, we have so much to offer. And I wanted that for my son, but I also wanted it for other autistic people too. So we started the library and all of the books and resources we offer are by autistic or otherwise disabled people. And um, we have a few books by professionals, but not many. Um, the majority of our books are like by people with lived experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so we set up, well, right now because of COVID, we're not setting up or doing mail order only, but we would set up at our community center twice a month for people who wanted to come in and have like, find resources, borrow books or movies. And um, then uh, like about a year after I started the library, I realized that a lot of the writing about neurodiversity and the neurodiversity movement was very academic and not really accessible. Yeah. And I am the kind of person I have to read things a lot in order to understand them. So I'm reading things three or four times before I can really process it. So I wanted to take some of those ideas and like break them down into something that was like easier to understand and like accessible to other people so <laughs> that's why we i've made the neurodivergent narwhals we're just kind of taking these ideas and making them like kind of in plain language and with cute little narwhals so they're really accessible <laughs> and <laughs> and um sharing those and that's been i think like when i started doing the narwhals the library got really popular not in my community only but like around <laughs> like a lot of people yeah um, have seen them and then um about a year after i started my library i had an email from a woman who lived in california who wanted to start a library and she's since actually moved up to washington state and lives in olympia but she started the second neurodiversity library and then we would meet other people who wanted to start a neurodiversity library and um just kind of like we connected online we had a facebook group called Neurodiversity Librarians. And now there's like Neurodiversity Libraries like in Canada, there's one in India and wow. in Australia. So it's really cool to see like what started with my little idea to have a library. <laughs> a lot of there are a lot of places. Yeah. Lee has really yeah. influenced a lot of people um, with the, um, the Neurodiversity Libraries. Um, Lee has actually presented at a national adaptive um, you know, like accessible libraries conference to kind of share these um, resources and perspectives with other librarians and um, to try to really hope that they can, you know, can follow suit. That's amazing. So if someone wanted to help open a neurodiversity library near them, what, what would they do? Well, um, they could join our neurodiversity librarians group on Facebook. Um, and it's just, a lot of us together and like sharing resources. And the best thing is when people ask like, how do you do it? Um, there's so many different ways to do it. Like I do the, well, I did do the in-person, which I hope to start again, you know, soon when it's safe. But um, some people just do like a little free library. Mm -hmm. Some people just do, um, they'll like collect money and donate books on their university to their local library. And there's just a lot of ways to do it which I think is really cool because people can do it the way that works for them and it's most accessible to them. So there's like not one way that you can do it. There's a lot of different ways. 
Okay, so we'll make sure that we also link to um, the Neurodiversity Library group in case people want to check that out. I have seen these narwhals all over social media. I love them. <laughs> I've used them myself. Um, one of the one of the biggest lens shifts for me that the narwhals actually helped with was that there isn't a wrong way to play um, because you know, especially like during the early intervention years, all of the neurotypical like milestones that are your, you know, autistic children are being compared with and like, you know, play skills that are being prioritized are neurotypical play skills. And so when I started, when I ran into your narwhals about autistic play, it was so empowering. And it, it's like, it gave me the, what I needed to be like, you know what, stop trying to make how she plays, like, just stop trying to interfere with her way of playing. Like, you can't tell someone how they should play because play has to be based on the person's interests. Well, I know that when I was a child, I, I didn't like playing with other kids. I liked being around them sometimes, but, um, I, I don't, I didn't, I guess I had um, ways of playing that weren't as considered weird by my parents. Um, one of my things that I did is I would collect um, dolls and um, make these elaborate doll houses and they were <laughs> like color coordinated <laughs> and make my own doll furniture. So that was like seen as creative and not weird. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was just like my sister would be playing dolls and have like, um, you know, like acting out scenes and I would just be like developing these like elaborate houses <laughs> and um, things like that. And then eventually when people thought it was weird that I didn't like play dolls with my sister, I started um, just basically recreating plot lines from soap operas that my mother watched and they thought it was funny. So <laughs> for personally, like my, I think my parents just thought, you know, like we're weird. She's probably like going to be like that too. So like, <laughs> <laughs> but, with my, but with my son, um, like in our family, no one criticized the way he played, but um, doctors would criticize the way that he lined up toys. He liked to line up his little cars from one end of the house to the other. And we always thought it was like kind of creative because they would be like all the red cars and then the blue cars and the green cars. So it was like a rainbow of cars. Yeah. I thought it was kind of cool. And then other things that he liked to do was... Um, he would tear apart newspapers and then put them back together the right way. <laughs> and, it, and I thought that was really like, we all were like super impressed, but our, the doctor's like, he just sits there and tears paper. And like, that's like, you need to have him evaluated, <laughs> but he was having fun. So we didn't really think there was anything wrong with that. Yeah. But, and it wasn't until like he kind of got school age where there were all these concerns and it made me like, a little worried just because there was so much concern mm -hmm. and it kind of made me doubt myself and you know my connection with Fallon was like it made me doubt that and it's kind of like crappy that that happened but yeah. <clears throat> but eventually like, he's always done things in his way and like in his own time and I started to realize like if I just was like would calm down <laughs> and just let him you know, kind of lead me that he would be fine. And like, yeah. <laughs> and he did things the way he needed to do them and there was nothing wrong with that. So. Yeah. <laughs> I remember um, when like, you know, I would always read things about children lining up toys and she never did that until very recently. And I'm kind of glad that she didn't start until recently because now I take pictures of them. I think it's amazing. You know, I would have, there probably would have been more stigma involved in those early years before I knew enough, you know, that would have like taken the joy out of seeing her create this, you know, cute little, and she makes them in rainbow shapes, which I think is oh, so adorable. Oh, <laughs> See, I, I take pictures of the uh, um, stuff that my children line up too, and I, I line things up as well myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do that too. I, I've, I've thought about that too, because Fallon talks a little bit about it in his video about why he would line things up, because he liked to look at it, because it was like, 
fun to look at. It was beautiful to look at. And then I think of like my collections, like I collect weird things like, <laughs> like um, art glass, like my grandma, I inherited a lot of art glass shoes from my grandmother. So I collect them and I like to line them up and just look at them and they make me happy. So I'm like, why, why couldn't he be happy looking at his cars? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so, um, it's such a, a shift when you can just appreciate the way someone sees the world through their own play. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I really, you helped us. I'm sure you've helped hundreds, if not thousands of other people who, who have seen those. So another thing that he uh, talked about was peer buddy programs. Mm -hmm. So these happen a lot. They're kind of like, social skills groups, those tend to happen a lot too. Mm -hmm. um, what are your opinions on those? Um, do you think they're helpful mm -hmm. or not helpful? I, I do not think that peer buddy programs in the traditional sense are helpful. And I think they're actually harmful and stigmatizing to the autistic person. Mm -hmm. And um, so when my son was in first grade, he had a really good teacher and um, she, she mentioned a peer buddy thing and I was like, oh, yikes. But, <laughs> but the way she meant it, she said, you know, he has a hard time with a lot of kids in the classroom and there is a certain child in this class who um, is just for some reason able to like help him stay calm and that child also had some learning disabilities where Fallon had strengths. Okay. So she said, you know, I don't want to like force a friendship, but like maybe we could like put them together and see what happens because where Fallon has more problems, like in a traditional classroom, this person mm -hmm. is like really good. And then where this other person had a harder time, Fallon was really good. So maybe they could like, you know, come together and you know support each other and that was a peer buddy program that I didn't mind yeah and they actually did end up like really liking each other and were friendly so that worked out well but then a few years later when we had to move and we were in a different school district um they wanted to have me put him in a traditional peer buddy program and I I said no because I did not like that idea because um it's based on my like the fact that they don't think that my son would have anything to offer as a friend and that he needed um, a typical child to help him like, you know, pretend to be normal, I guess is the best way to say it. And he didn't need that. And he, and so, you know, sometimes autistic kids don't have a lot of friends in their classroom. And I understand that that's like something that people worry about, but I don't think that making them feel bad about who they are is a way to help them make friends. <laughs> right. And um, that's all I can see from those programs is like you're taking this child and saying like nobody wants to be your friend so we're just going to assign somebody to like you know kind of be on your back all the time and like force you to act a certain way. And even yeah. Alan described it as a parasite because that's what he felt like <laughs> when I mean, he had never been through that kind of peer buddy program, but he had friends who have, and I was like kind of describing it. And then I showed him, you know, the wording of like different programs just to see, you know, what he thought for when he did his presentation, because I said, you know, this is something we should probably talk about because people think it's a good idea. And I want to know what you think about it. And he just did not like it at all. He said, I, <laughs> so he did not like wow. that. Idea. He's so smart. Like, and I'm he's at the definition of parasite. He's never, yeah. He's <laughs> never had a problem making friends in his own way. And, right. I, and I even remember when he was really small, we would go to the park and um, I would try to get him to, to go, you know, so he could see other people besides me every day. And he had a buddy that he met there and it was a woman who was like in her 60s and she was always at the park doing yoga and that was his friend and they had fun <laughs> like, That's and nice. so he had, he had perfect like social skills you know to yeah. make a friend just like not it didn't look like what other people wanted it to look like but yeah. you know that was his friend and he's always been that way where he can make the friends that he needs in his own way <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so I don't I just I would 
I just don't like those peer buddy programs. But I'm also, I actually had a peer buddy when I was a kid and they didn't call it that. And it was incredibly traumatizing when I found out that they were not my real friends. Because for a year, I was assigned to a couple of girls in my class. And um, what I didn't know at the time, it was years later, I was in high school when I found out and this happened when I was in fifth grade. And that whole year they were my friends. And then the next year they weren't my friends anymore. And I didn't understand why. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And finally in high school, um, one of them told me, you know, like our teacher wanted us to sit with you because you're weird and you don't talk. And yeah. And then, so it was very traumatizing when I found out. Yeah. And I, the thing is I did have one friend who liked me the way I was. So I, I don't know if my parents signed off on that. I never really asked them, mm-hmm. but um, I do know that teachers were concerned about me because I was very quiet. I didn't talk in school, so. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I I would say from my experience, I would never put a child in that type of program. Yeah, it's like if you want the child, if you're concerned about the fact that the child has no friends, if you want it, or a few friends, if you want to guarantee they're not going to have friends, assign them a buddy. A buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think too that like what gets forgotten in a lot of this is that A, I mean, clearly you all have feelings. Um, No one wants to be a person that people are assigned to as if it's like a job. And, um, you know, also when people make friends with each other, they generally do it because there's, they have, shared interests or, you know, Mm -hmm. um, similar traits or things that they feel connection over. And so you can't really force something like that anyway. Um, But, you know, and and research, uh, there's a few researchers who delve into topics sort of related to this. Um, I mentioned him in another webinar we will be showing as well, but um, Dr. Damian Milton is an autistic researcher who discusses the double empathy problem. And so, you know, um, just as it may be difficult for some autistic people to um, kind of like see things from a neurotypical lens, it's equally as difficult for neurotypical people to see things through an autistic lens. And, you know, we may have different ways of socializing and I think one of the key things in all of you know the neurodiversity library and in Fallon's presentation, which everyone will see, is that you know just because the communication and style is different, it doesn't make it wrong. And giving people, especially young kids, that message is completely unacceptable. And I really am like going to demand of neurotypical people here to like get with the program and realize that, you know, having this sort of bias hurts people and it's not helping. Um, And it's, you know, if we want better for our kids and for the autistic community, we have to understand that like we play an important role in, um, you know, being good friends back. Um, uh, Vikram Jaswal also has research about um, basically looking at being versus appearing socially interested and autistic, many autistic people show, you know, social interests differently. Uh, just as you were saying, Lee, like it's not that he didn't want friends or connection. I mean, my daughter is the same where, you know, she's not overly social, especially with people she doesn't know well. She needs to feel trust. She needs to feel safe with them. And she wants connection and wants to be around us and wants to be around other people, but she's not going to be like doing it in the same way that my neurotypical daughter would do. But the need is still there. So we have to make sure that we realize that. And then, you know, uh, uh, I've heard other people say about um, social skills groups, especially um, that a lot of times they're kind of um, encouraging things that aren't even expected rules of neurotypicals. Like we're putting rules on autistic kids that neurotypical kids don't even have to follow. So it's not there. Yeah. (laughs) 
So the next topic that is really important is about screen time and screen shaming. Um, I have a lot to say about this myself, but Lee, why don't you start? So um, one of the main reasons that um, my son wanted to do this presentation was like the screen shaming. He, he feels a lot of that. But um, screens have actually helped him a lot to be social and to make friends, not just with like typing to people because it can be more comfortable for myself and for him to type instead of speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, it's also like allowed him to meet friends. And, and he talks about how he does this. We do this safely. We actually wrote a social story together before I let him have online accounts about, um, you know, like how to interact with strangers, what to say if they ask your name, you know, kind of things like that. So he's met friends online. Um, and one of the friends that he met is actually also autistic and lives um, in the UK and they both are gamers and they talk about gaming a lot. And it's really fun to see how excited he gets to talk about his friend. They, they just have so much in common. Yeah. And he also, he uses his screen not just to communicate, but also it's, um, he uses it to play. And, <laughs> and um, he has uh, some pictures in his slide. It's like um, a collage, one of him with his friend H and one of him with his friend Andrew and one of him with his cousin. And they're both, and the pictures are sitting side by side and they're on their individual devices. And it looks like they're ignoring each other, but they're playing together. <laughs> They're in the same world in the same game and they're like laughing and interacting and it's fun for them. And it's even sometimes when they don't play the same game together and they're just sitting together, it's a way for them to feel like close without having to like do the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. So he, he does use the screen and we come up with rules on screen time where it's pretty much I let him figure out his own limits because I think that's important so that he can regulate himself yeah and um <clears throat> yeah but he does get criticized a lot when we would go one I remember a time we went to a restaurant and he brought his iPad and um actually the server was really rude about it like you should be talking to your parents and it's just it helps him though to have the screen there is yeah like kind of a thing with his anxiety in a loud place where everybody's like talking and there's a lot of background noise it's easy for him to be able to focus on that and it so that he can go out to dinner and like have a nice meal with us and interact with us and even like type things to us on his um, iPad. So yeah, he, he, he feels a lot of time that people don't understand why he uses the screen as much as he does. And they still kind of sometimes don't believe him that it's actually very helpful for him. Right. So, <laughs> and it's, I know that's a frustrating thing for him. And it was a frustrating thing for me too, because I, I do use my screen a lot to talk to people rather than interact in person. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so that that was kind of like his biggest motivation, I think, for his presentation was to help people to understand a little bit better about how he communicates and interacts with people. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my daughter loves her screen. Um, she uses it for a lot of reasons. She uses it for self-regulation, communication, um, which could be anything from, uh, you know, she goes to the dentist and she's playing the Peppa Pig dentist clip, or, you know, she's going down the slide and playing Daniel Tiger going down the slide at the same time and saying, we, <laughs> um, you know, and, and a lot of, a lot of an issue that I have too, is that she also, as an AAC user, always has a screen with her because that's her, you know, form of, of communication. And a lot of parents, you know, have heard these, these, uh, you know, scary stories, I guess, about, you know, what screen time will do to their kids. And, and so other small children have been like, why does she have a screen with her at school? Or, you know, um, and so like, it's important to realize that, you know, people use screens for different reasons. And like, we don't want to stigmatize that because 
some people really do rely on them and use them for a lot of purposes. Um, and I would like to cite that there is uh, an Oxford study that was done on more than 350,000 adolescents and it showed persu persuasively that at a population level, technology use has a nearly negligible effect on adolescent psychological well-being, uh, including questions on depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation, pro-social behavior, peer relationship problems, and the like. So- and they've been lying us and guilting us all these years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and perhaps at some point, maybe they'll, you know, find different evidence. I don't know, but- you know, it's it's kind of unfair that this stigma has been put on technology when in a lot of ways technology has transformed so many people's lives and made things easier. And I, I hope people will realize that um, screens are not just like wasting time or, you know, causing people not to socialize. Um, you know, it's a, it's a way for a lot of people to share joy and connection. What do you, what is both of your advice as autistic people with autistic children? What is your advice um, for how especially parents can help their autistic children thrive? I think my main advice would be to trust your child because I think a lot of advice that you get as the parent of an autistic person is to not trust your child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is to like, yeah. you know, put them in some kind of therapy, like, you know, that will like <clears throat> make them be more compliant and change how they like, interact and communicate or else. Um, one thing that I, I'll, I remember when my son, he didn't talk until he was about six years old and it, um, his speech therapist was really good, but at his school, I was encouraged to ignore him unless he used his words. And to me, I, if I knew what he wanted, I, I never did take that advice, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But um, if I knew what he wanted, he didn't need to use words because he was communicating what he wanted just fine. You know, he used yeah. signs or pointing, and there were a lot of ways for him to communicate. But I feel like a lot of times parents of autistic kids are really encouraged not to trust your kids and not to like build a relationship with them. So I would say ignore all that advice <laughs> and trust your kids more because I think that relationship is gonna be way more important than anything else. So. Yeah. I think that's really key. Trust your child and I would say within reason, trust yourself. I say within reason because some of us parents got some issues. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the reason why I'm saying it is because a parent, a parent can have different neurology than their child. But that doesn't mean that you as a parent don't, look, you know, for the most part, love your child, want them to be comfortable, want the best for them. And because you don't trust yourself and you trust that this professional says I need to ignore my child and do this. This yeah. professional says my child needs to learn how to do things this way. Um, and I feel bad, my child's crying or sad, but I need to do what they say. No, you uh, uh, typically, it's not for everyone. Most people, I think your, your parental instinct will be, my child is lining these things up, my child is happy. I know what my child wants, they're pointing, they're not saying it, but they're communicating with me. I right. know my child loves me, they're, you know, but in their own way, they're putting their foot on my, my knee or whatever it is that they do, they don't have to say the words, I love you. Don't let the world tell you that because your child doesn't present in the way that they think, a child should present that your child is anything less than the beautiful, wonderful child that you have right there in your arms. Don't let them um, poison your perspective of your own child. Yeah. And this is why I love all of you because <laughs> it's, you know, all it, it like in that early space, especially I like, I remember thinking like, do I know how to parent her now? And, you know, you have a team of professionals like suggesting things and you feel like you don't know anything. So, you know, as, as a neurotypical parent, especially I had zero experience and, but what helped give me the courage was hearing autistic people talk about these things. So this is like, so again, I know I say this to both of you a lot, but thank you so much.
thank you to everyone in the autistic community. As a parent, as a neurotypical parent, you have changed my kid's life and many others. So I'm really appreciative. Thank you. Well, it's encouraging to, that there are people listening and learning. It's encouraging that the research is starting to back up what we've been saying all along. And, you know, and it's just encouraging that, you know, like Fallon is young, but what Fallon is saying is what I would say, you know, I mean, obviously we're different, but what Lee would say Fallon is, you know, I, I just really feel like everyone is in for a treat because this is just such deep and such real information about how to respect the ways that we are and how to, to thrive in the life that you have with the neurology that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone stay tuned for the amazing Fallon and we're really excited to show him. My name is Fallon Mitski and I'm going to talk about autistic ways of playing, interacting and making friends. My mom is going to be helping me when needed with this presentation, but she's not speaking for me. My mom is not my voice. Parents should amplify their kids' voices, but never speak for them, even if they don't talk. It's more accessible for you to talk on video instead in front of a live audience, so that's how I will do this presentation. There are some slides that my mom will describe for you. I'll start this off by telling you a little bit about myself. I am a sophomore in high school and co-founder of the Ed Wiley Autism Acceptance Library in Salem, Washington. I enjoy gaming, comic books, and cats, among a few other things. When I was young, doctors and therapists told my mom that I needed to play differently. When I'm told that I play in the wrong way, it makes me feel kind of upset. I liked logging up toys for lots and lots of reasons, but no one had ever asked me why. The pros to logging up toys is some people like to have things in order, some people like to look at patterns, and they help they helped me see all the parts and rebuild them in different ways, and that is creativity, more or less. It also made me feel good to look at my collection, and it had never hurt anybody either. I interact with the world in autistic ways, and there is nothing wrong with that. There is no right way to play, but in my eyes the most important thing is that everyone has fun. Just because you don't understand the value of doing things my way doesn't make it wrong. Telling people how they need or have to play kind of defeats the purpose of playing in the first place. Autistic people experience a lot of sensory input, which is almost impossible to shut off. My brain is working really hard to process things that non-autistic people don't even have to think about, such as fluorescent lights, loud noises, too many noises at once, people talking too fast, uh, certain smells, and a bunch of other stuff. You don't have to understand any of this in order to respect autistic people. In a real friendship, both people benefit and both people are equal. In this sense, a pure buddy relationship feels like you have a parasite that is constantly on you. Autistic kids such as myself have a lot of value to offer as friends. Friends are not there to constantly correct you and teach you how to act non-autistic and act that is belittling and harmful. My friend Kelsey was not my pure buddy. He is a real friend who is not autistic that I met in fourth grade. He never tries to make me act more like him or mentor me to be more typical. He likes me for who I am and we have a lot in common. He's much more social than me, but he respects that I'm more of an introvert and I respect that he isn't. Because our friendship goes both ways and we both have a lot to bring to the table. One of my favorite things to do with my cousins and my friends is to game together. Some people might be thinking, oh, well, they're just looking at their screens and not interacting. This is not true. Sometimes we're playing a game together. Sometimes we're on our own game, but we're still interacting and stuff. And sometimes we are, we are showing each other interesting things in the game, or one of us is gaming and the other isn't. Some autistic people really enjoy parallel play because you don't have to be doing the same thing together all the time to enjoy each other's company. It's a more relaxing way to be together. I think people worry too much about screen time, but it's actually really ableist. Screens help a lot of autistic people to communicate and socialize in ways that work with their brains. Technology provides access for lots of people with disabilities, including myself. Do not be afraid to let your kids use technology if that's what helps them communicate and make friends. Parents and kids should talk about internet safety and try to make sure that your kid can be honest and communicate with you openly about the friends that they make online. You should set 
And if you can set limits on screen time, do it together. Because kids deserve to have a voice in that. And do not shame kids for liking screen time because you think a different way is better. In my eyes, typing is easier to express my feelings than talking in real life. When you go online, you can find people who share common interests with you. A lot of autistic people don't have direct communication styles, and the words you type don't have much of a tone or a hidden meaning, or at least they don't for me. You don't have to worry about hidden social rules that cause anxiety, and you don't have to be afraid of technology, but you should always be safe online. I have friends at school, but I have made friends online who share interests with me. I'm really into this computer game called Geometry Dash, and I have followed some YouTubers who make videos about gaming. Sometimes we talk, sometimes we don't. I ended up chatting with some people and befriended another gamer named Peter. We have lots in common, he's also an autistic gamer, but he lives all the way all the way in the United Kingdom, and we never could have met if it weren't for the internet. I've actually chatted with people all over the world who enjoy the same things as me, and that's friendship, and it makes me feel good to know that I can make friends in my own way in different situations. On this slide is my comparison chart of the effects of acceptance versus the effects of rejection of autistic ways of being. In my experience, I feel more accepted by my parents. Obviously, they're not perfect, because, well, nobody is. But I think they gave me more opportunities to find my own way. This has made me feel good about myself and made me proud of being autistic. My advice to parents and professionals is to be more accepting when you talk and converse with your child. You can be more accepting by not forcing speech because communication is lots of things. And don't force your ways of life upon them because it might not make sense for them. And if it doesn't, don't belittle them. Don't belittle them for it. You don't have to understand why autistic people do certain things in order to respect it and respect your kids. And don't teach your kids to be ashamed of disability. Let them know that you're always proud of them.